Hello. I'm not sure what the chances are that we'll be able to do it via my computer today, but hopefully technology is in our favor. Um, if not, I will absolutely hop over to my phone as I've been doing um, the last few uh, the last two days. So um, anyways, I will give everyone just a second to kind of hop on here. Um, but what my intention for today is for you guys is to cover common injuries. Um, not in the sense of I am breaking apart exactly what to do. Um, because number one, everyone is so different. So for me to create a sheet for you that says, you know, do this and this will get rid of your back pain, it's just not gonna happen. Um, what's up, Val? Uh, so my intention for you today is to learn some tips and tricks as far as how to keep people safe. Um, like I said, if you are looking to dive deeper into specific injuries, specific things, um, we'll cover a few today, um, but please note that my course, my online course called Functional Anatomy has everything you need to know in it as far as breaking things down, modifying flows. Um, the, the flow in the course is actually a back pain flow because that's the most common injury I see on the yoga mat um, and why people get referred to yoga. So if you are looking to dive deeper, please head over um, to the Functional Anatomy course. And reminder, you get $100 off if you use the code ready now. Um, so that will cover common injuries and I believe that's module three in the course. Um, doesn't need to follow, excuse me, you don't need to go through and follow module one, two, and three, but they definitely do play very well into each other. So with that being said, let's hop in. Um, I do have some notes today, so if you see me looking down, that's what I'm doing. Um, yes, okay, so basically um, how I wanna start common injuries today is just by saying, number one, everyone is different. So when you are thinking about the injuries that people have, why they show up onto their mat, um, maybe a doctor has referred them onto their mat, whatever it may be, why are they there? They are there to find healing. Um, why do people show up to their mat? Maybe for the physical practice, but at the end of the day, what keeps them on their mat is all of the physical healing, um, the emotional healing, and the spiritual healing that yoga offers. Um, myself in particular, I showed up for the physical. Um, I was taking a Baptiste style. That's what attracted me to it. Um, and then I think most of you know, I went through a very traumatic sexual experience. I was raped. And basically what kept me on my mat was the spiritual healing that it offered me. It was no longer, my practice was no longer driven by the physical, it was driven by the emotional and the spiritual. And I found alignment in my being. Um, I was able to heal past emotional traumas. I was able to heal my current emotional trauma at the time. Um, and that is really truly what kept me on my mat and what kept me showing up. Um, but had it not been for the physicality of the vinyasa practice, um, I've been an athlete my whole life. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten so into it. Maybe I wouldn't have found that spiritual blessing. Um, I'm not sure, but again, that's what attracted me to it. Um, okay, so not one size fits all, right? So if you have somebody with an, a wrist injury, they may, they may feel okay if you modify them on a block. So instead of having their whole hand on the ground, now they have a block, they have something to cup and hold. Um, same thing goes for somebody with a wrist injury. They may not be able to do this block hold. You might have to just keep everything on their forearms. They might be okay in a fist position. So just thinking about what body part is injured and how can you change it. So if you think about, we'll start at the feet. Again, I always start at the feet. So if we think about the feet, um, if somebody has an ankle injury, what's going to be hard for them? Probably balancing. So how can you modify the balance to make it easier? Maybe you let them hold onto a wall. Maybe you um, are doing chair yoga. Maybe you always have two feet on the floor, and instead of playing with tree pose, you pay, play with taking um, whatever the injured side is taking in the back, taking the other toes in front, and then you can vice versa switch. So you always have two feet on the floor, but now we're more on a tightrope with our feet um, versus just having one foot on the floor. Um, so different things to think about. What could be going on at the foot? If they have tight plantar fasciitis, um, tanner, excuse me, tight plantar fascia, um, think 
Yes, how do we do the opposite? Toes pose. The toes pose will stretch. So anytime you want to stretch something, think about doing the opposite. Toes pose, um, where you just curl your toes under and sit back on your heels. A really great modification for people with tight plantar fascia. However, the balancing might be the issue. So while they're in crescent lunge in the front foot, they're trying to find balance. They're trying to ground down through the base of their big toe. That might fire up the fascia, because if you think about grounding down, it's going to scrunch all the plantar fascia. If you pretend the hand is the foot, it will scrunch and tighten all of the plantar fascia. Um, vice versa, if the in crescent lunge, the foot in the back is causing you pain, you're up high on your back toes, you're lengthening your hamstring up to the sky, that might lengthen and tighten and maybe cramp up the bottom of your foot. So a simple modification for that would be, number one, find warrior two, but also don't let the heel be so stacked over the toes. Try and sit the heel back just a little bit. That might feel like a good stretch. That might take the pressure off. That might make it worse, right? So we're just playing. You will never have all of the answers. I will never have all of the answers. So I'm not here to give you the answers. I don't have them. I am here to offer you suggestions as to how to help. Because if you have two or three things in your toolbox, you will find something for that person. And if not, you will tell them not to do it. You will tell them to just rock into something maybe totally different. Um, it just depends. Because again, everyone's built differently. Everyone's past emotional traumas are going to live in their being, and that's going to affect their physical body. Um, everybody's past injuries live, and then the fascia starts to contort around it. So I can't really tell you what exactly to do, but I can definitely offer you modifications and show you how to see the body differently. That is my intention for you here, and that is my intention for you in my online course just helping you see the body differently and have a different set of tools so that you can be of service to your people. Good. So not one size fits all. Um, and if it hurts, don't do it. That is the best modification I have for you guys as yoga teachers and as yoga students. If something is bothering you, please don't do it. Simple, simple, simple. Um, find a modification for it. And okay, here's another one I get a lot. Um, I have a lot of students that are scared to try something or maybe they've been injured in something, um, injured in a posture or injured in life doing some sort of activity and then certain movements make them hesitant. So for example, low back pain, you'll see people with pain, fear of going into forward flexion. Um, so a forward fold trying to touch their toes. My suggestion for you here is not to just cut it out. Don't just not forward fold because how functional is a forward fold? You will hear me use this word functional a ton. I think you need to teach for functionality, especially as the population you're teaching gets older and especially as they start to have more injuries. You have to keep it functional so that they can do things in life better. It's one thing to be able to achieve this beautiful handstand press, blah, 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 crow pose, perfect crescent lunge twist with the hip staying in perfect alignment. It's another thing to be able to pick your child up and off the floor. It's another thing to be able to get up and off the floor if you've fallen. It's another thing to be able to put your dishes away, to go grocery shopping by yourself. So keep it functional because that is what we need. That is why we come to the yoga. We show up to the yoga so that we can handle life better, right? There's that funny meme quote thing that's like people think all yogis have it all together, but really we're all just a mess and we go to yoga to handle our messes. You need a way of an outlet. So my biggest thing is while you have your students on your mat, are you keeping it functional for them? The more of an advanced practitioner maybe wants that handstand. So give them stuff to help make it more practical for them. But again, keeping it functional. So teaching them how to use their hamstrings correctly, teaching them how to use their hip flexors and strengthen their hip flexors um, is more beneficial. The handstand will come because of that. But now they are just going to be overall around stronger um, in the proper ways. So, um, but back to our back pain client. So pain with forward folds. We have to continue to do them. And how do we modify? So if somebody has pain in a forward fold, what can you do? You can make the forward fold less 
rounded. Um, you can make the forward fold just less range of motion. So what does this look like? Maybe stacking a bunch of blocks up on top of each other. Maybe you take one block the long way and one block so it almost looks like a capital T, and that's enough height for them. So you give them a little something to balance on or it gives their hands a little cue as to how far they can go down. Um, maybe you have them take their hands onto their thighs and find almost like a halfway lift quality in their back and their chest and their low back, and then they just can slide their hands down their thighs, stop right on top of your knees as you still are pressing your hands in. So from here, we have a little bit more back extension, and then maybe you cue some cat-cow so they start to look up at their belly button. From this halfway position, they start to add in some light flexion. Um, another really cool way to add in flexion is to have them lay on their back. So have them lay on their back, hug their knees into their chest. So the thighs are still coming closer to the chest, but the spine is able to stay in a little bit more of a neutral position, but we're still playing with where the pelvis is. So as you draw your knees into your chest, let your pelvis come off the ground. You might feel your low back lift off the ground. You're able to come into a little bit more controlled flexion there, um, more flexion in the low back, less in the mid spine. Um, which might be good. Most people who fear forward folds fear them because of the low back, not usually because of the mid back. I'm not saying it's not possible, more T-spine um, pain inflection, but normally it's going to be from the low back. So having them lay on their back, hug their knees into their chest is an awesome modification. Um, but then also making the motions smaller will keep them safer, will keep them compact. Um, but if somebody is scared to do something, it's not your job to tell them to just go do it, to just push through, push through, push through. Oh, it'll be fine, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Um, that's not your job. You have to help warm them up to the idea of wanting to open up. So um, we have little tricks to help work around that. Some of these look like just making the motion much smaller. You show them that things are possible. You show them that whatever you're asking them to do, they actually can do in their being. And then number one, they start to trust you, right? We need more money, we need more privates. They start to trust you. You build your no like, and trust. You have less people leaving with pain and you have more people actually healing themselves in your class um, because they are able to get out of some of these misconceptions in their mind that their body's not able to do some of these activities. Um, so you're able to keep them safer um, through the smaller range of motion so they start to gain trust back to their body and then you can teach them how to turn on all the muscles so when you're in your little halfway lift with your hands on your thighs you're cueing this cat position where you're rounding your spine a little bit now pull your belly up and in squeeze through your outer glutes and protect your low back you can slowly add in some more of these muscular engagement cues so that you're teaching them how to use the body properly, how to turn on the right set of muscles properly without pushing them into these range of motions that they don't even believe is safe in their being. If they don't have the minds where you need, where they need it to be, don't make them do it. Don't make them do it. Um, okay, so, but then we can also start to work around some of them, and, and again, it's more of tricking them to do it, but really we're just offering them a more simplified version. Um, another one I see a lot of is people scared to do wheel pose, um, which, you know, it is a really great range of motion. It's a big range of back extension um, in wheel pose, but it also is a lot of shoulder flexion too. So with the hands coming overhead, some people, um, women particularly, I will hear them say they don't have um, the upper body strength for it. It's a cop out, definitely a cop out. Um, but what we can do is again, trick them into thinking they can do wheel pose. So what we do is we start them in a bridge. Start them in the simplified version of wheel. Start them in bridge. Start to cue the hamstrings, cue the glutes. Can you feel those there? Yes, there. Um, can you offer them maybe a block squeeze between their knees or maybe they need to press out more. If you feel them just dumping into their low back and you feel the, you, excuse me, in bridge pose you see the back arching a lot, they're already relying on their range of motion. They're not relying on the strength of their legs. So notice where the motion is coming from because that is going to be your overuse spot. So start them in bridge. 
have them cue the legs. You're cueing the muscular engagement in the thighs and in the glutes, in the inner thighs, in the outer glutes, in the belly. You're knitting your ribs together. You're pulling your pelvic floor, swooping your belly up, whatever your beautiful cues are. From there, in our bridge, maybe you start to ask them to just take their hands like they're coming into wheel. And then you just have them stay there. And then they squeeze their elbows in together and they press their elbows back towards their ears and they're pressing, pressing, pressing. And then from there, maybe you start to have them press into the floor. Again, if they don't trust their neck or they don't trust their upper body strength, just have them hold here. Another awesome trick, if you've never tried this, um, try it with a friend first who's comfortable in wheel. Don't let this first try be on one of your students. Um, but you want to, as the teacher, you'd have them in a uh, wheel prep, so in kind of a bridge with their hands, but their hands are going to be on your ankles. So you have one foot, um, your right foot is going to be by their right ear, their left, your left foot will be by their left ear, um, but a little bit wider, so they're, it's in that little bit more where your hands would be. It's not right close, a little bit further away, and then they can grab onto your ankles. From there, you can start to press straight in your arms, drive through your legs, lift your hips up to the sky. So they're holding onto your ankles. It requires less shoulder range of motion here. So it requires less of this because I'm holding onto your hands and you're actually able to dial into your bicep just by the way your hand is facing versus the palm flat. You're here. You can, everyone try that, feel it. So take your hands, um, almost like you're serving a reverse pizza, like you're coming into wheel and take your hand on your bicep. So you can feel when the palm is almost straight up to the sky, twist it a little bit. Can you feel the little belly of your muscle wanting to engage just a little bit? So that will help the press up. Why? Because the bicep is in charge of supination as well. So again, you don't need to know that, but you can feel it. You can feel it in your being as you switch your grip so it's more holding onto my ankle kind of grip, um, almost like you're holding onto a cup you'll feel the bicep engage more. You're able to push more. Um, so if you're lacking the upper body strength, that's a really awesome trick to, again, trick. It's just a modification. It's a different way to do it. Um, from there, if they don't trust their upper body strength, maybe you start to just play with some hand, wall handstands, or maybe it looks like push-ups, or maybe it just looks like holding plank. Um, maybe you hold a reverse tabletop position with their hands behind you. Um, and just start playing with these, having them gain confidence in their upper body strength. So when it comes to wheel pose, they can't use that excuse anymore. Because you can say, you just held plank for a minute. You just did a wall handstand for 30 seconds. You have upper body strength. We just need to change it up a little bit. Um, again, bridge to wheel is just one I see a lot of. Um, people are more scared to do it, don't trust themselves versus an actual injury. But um, don't discredit someone being scared to do something and don't just push them into it. Some people need a little bit more of a push, but some people just need a little bit of loving. Um, and that's why they show up to their mat as well. So know your students, get to know them, get to know who you can push, get to know who you need to kind of just let them do their thing. Um, all right, so let's dive into some actual injuries. We started with the foot. We're going to come up into the knees. So with the knees, I had an awesome question and maybe it was Casey. I don't remember actually who asked this. Sorry. Sorry, ladies. Um, somebody had asked about hyperextension in the knees. Um, so if people hyperextend at the knees, um, they don't feel a full stretch in the muscle of the hamstring, particularly I'm thinking down dog, maybe a seated forward fold, maybe a regular forward fold as well. Um, they feel more of a sensation behind the back of their knee versus in the actual muscle belly. Um, why does this happen? Usually because most people, excuse me, most people who hyperextend, it changes the entire, if you think of the body as a machine, which I know it's not, but if you think about it as a machine, when you have hyperextension in your knees, you change the entire alignment of what's going on. Um, you change the entire, what we call line of pull. Line of pull is just where the muscles insert and attach, um, which creates uh, movement in the joints, which creates movement from the bones itself based off where the tendons insert, um, where the muscle is strong, where the muscle is overactive, underactive, a bunch of different things, where the fascia is tight, yada, yada. 
Um, but basically what you can see with people who hyperextend their knees is that they will, they might feel just a sensation behind the back of their knees and maybe up into the bottom that you'll feel the sensation more over the tendinous junction, um, versus in the muscle belly, uh, because they hyperextend and it changes the range of the, again, the line of pull where the muscles are actually pulling the bones to create a change in the joints. Um, so what we can do is of course bend the knees. Bend the knees and particularly with the hamstrings in this case, you wanna play with where the pelvis is. Because if you think about the hamstrings, they insert all the way up by your bum, underneath, literally on your sits bones where people consider their sits bones. So with this being said, because the hamstrings insert all the way at your pelvis, you can start to play with some anterior and posterior tilt. So I will show you. When you are here, and you think about the hamstrings, they insert all the way up right underneath the butt of the booty. It's called your ischial tuberosity. But when you think about an anterior pelvic tilt, think about this hamstring is actually getting longer versus the hamstrings actually getting shorter. Longer and shorter. So when you're in your down dog, start to play with some of this anterior and posterior tilt. Again, you always want a little curvature in the low back. We keep the lumbar spine in lower doses. So a little bit of the curvature in the back, um, but unlocking the knees and almost like you can send your hams, um, send your sacrum to the sky. You want to find more, a little bit more of an anterior pelvic tilt. This will take this. This should take, I should say, the sensation out from behind your knee, and it should bring it a little bit more up into the muscle belly. Um, with that being said, hyperextension in the knees. It's not wrong. It's not right. It is how you are built. Honor it, love it, but modify it. Um, so the biggest thing that I see, particularly, um, I notice this a lot when I teach the Hot 26 practice, um, the anatomy, because Hot 26 perpetually has a lot of locking out your knees, locking out your knees, and that's kind of what the, the context says um, as far as this manuscript goes. I don't like locking your knees in what I call a closed kinetic chain position. So again, I don't enjoy when people lock their knees out in a closed kinetic chain position. What is a closed kinetic chain position? It is when your leg is weight bearing, basically. When you're, so if I am doing a right leg uh, standing head to knee where the leg's extended and I'm trying to round my spine um, with the leg kicked straight out in front of me, if I am balancing on my right leg, I do not want to cue somebody into locking the leg out. If they hyperextend, if your leg comes more to a neutral position, great. If the hyper, excuse me, if the locking the knee out, again, all of these cues of locking out doesn't really bother you or doesn't cause any, again, what I call it compressive force. So you feeling kind of that bone on bone, you're feeling kind of achy specifically through the knee joint, totally should be safe. If you hyperextend, I hyperextend, when I lock my knee out, and I played with this in practice safely, again, because I teach the anatomy, I play with it always, what feels good, what doesn't, I understand what feels good on me, will not feel good on somebody else, um, but when I perpetually am locking out my standing leg, again, that's my closed chain, I start to have knee pain. I start to feel sensations in the back of my knee. I start to feel compressive, like a one finger point pain in the front of my knee because I'm dialing into my quad so much. Because when I hyperextend, when I hyperextend and my knee comes back a little, my patella actually gets sucked down towards the knee joint just a little bit more. But with that being said, when you unlock the knee, it makes the balance harder. Harder. I was telling you guys yesterday with alignment, play in your balancing postures with the knee unlocked to train stability in the knee. Stability in the knee is absolutely the way to go. So keeping the knee unlocked just a little bit will help take away a lot of the pain that you get behind the knee. Um, that's with hyperextension in the knees. Um, However, with the leg that is in the open chain position, so the leg that is not weight-bearing, as long as it doesn't cause pain, 
I'm pretty okay with it being locked out because it's non-weight bearing. The only forces coming through it are that of gravity. Again, gravity comes straight down. When you are standing, you are pressing your forces down onto the ground and you have other forces coming back up on you. Again, these are called ground reaction forces. This is Newton's third law. Um, every action causes an equal and opposite reaction. So again, bringing a little bit of fix physics in, but really to help you guys learn the why. For me, if I can learn the why things are a certain way, you can start to apply the principles to a bunch of different things. In my online course, Functional Anatomy, Functional, um, excuse me, Functional Anatomy, we get into this. I remind you of the principles. I remind you of the little spots that we can plug them in. Because again, I truly feel that that really helps me be able to take the principles and apply them into different postures um, without having to be told. I just kind of understand how it works a little bit better to be able to apply it to what's in front of me as I'm teaching so you can work a little bit better on the fly. When you can work a little bit better on the fly, you're keeping their students in their bodies, in their practice. You're helping them have a deeper experience. And that is why we teach yoga. So, um, cool, if there's any questions, please, please feel free to leave comments. Um, if there are specific injuries you wanna make sure we cover, um, I'm gonna talk about scoliosis here in a second, but if there's any injuries you want to particularly cover, make sure you leave them and I will get to them. Um, so long as everything is reacting well and it seems to be. So, okay, um, scoliosis next. So just moving up, um, a lot of what I see in scoliosis, you're going to see in the hips, which is why I talk about scoliosis next. So with scoliosis, you think about the spine. It can be, normally when you see scoliosis, it is the spine being sideways. So you'll see the sternum, again, we look for alignment. You see the sternum with the belly button and you see the belly button out of alignment with the sternum. So usually scoliosis, I see in this kind of side to side motion. Um, versus going to be more of an anterior posterior. By all means, they can be a little bit more rounded that um, forward to backwards, anterior to posterior versus left to right. But normally you'll see scoliosis um, and what they call scoliosis, more of the spine kind of curving to the side. So instead of just looking like a straight line down the back, you'll see it kind of jut off to the side for a few of them. Um, the biggest thing with scoliosis is, yes, yoga has been proven to heal some scoliosis, not all. Um, but the biggest thing is, whatever way the spine veers off to, I will draw you this really great picture. Please know I am not an artist. Um, but basically, if we think about this being the spine, and this is the, this is the pelvis here, this is our spine. The curves go left versus right. The side that is tight is going to be here, not the side that it's going away from. So if you think about all these back muscles, they are going to be loose on this side. They are going to be extra tight on this side. So the muscles in our back that are tight, the curve will go away from. Think about when a muscle gets tight, it shortens. When a muscle gets tight, it shortens. Therefore, the spine moves away from the tight muscles, and then it starts to get overstretched on the opposite side. Um, so if you take somebody and have their shirt off, women in sports bras, men can have their shirts off. Um, again, just keep it practical. Um, have them forward fold and touch their toes. Easiest to see in that position, any scoliosis. Um, but normally, people will kind of know, and if not, that's totally fine. What we look for most is squaring in the hips. So because the spine is shaped like that, we always want the hips to be nice in alignment because you'll see one side gets shorter and the other side gets longer. So think about your crescent lunge positions. You wanna make sure that you're cueing the hips not only square in this up and down, so the right hip's not on top of the left hip, you wanna square them in the front to back as well. So particular in crescent lunge with the right foot forward, my cue is pull the right hip back, press the left hip forward. Some of 
with scoliosis that's tight on the right side, you might see the right hip way up to the sky. Now pull your right hip down as you press more through the back hamstring on your left leg, press your left hip up to the sky and find squaring there. That way, make them hold it, but they're holding it in more of that squaring position, that squared off position, um, versus always falling into the common patterns that their body is easily falling into, which then they're gonna wanna do over and over and over again. We are creatures of habit. We fall into our habits, we stay with our habits. Um, and then we always just compensate through whatever spot wants to do it most easiest, um, which is gonna be the way you do it most often, which causes our overuse and what we call chronic injuries, chronic just meaning overuse. Um, so with scoliosis, I always wanna check in with the hips, but then we want to strengthen the back. How do we strengthen the back? Locust pose all day. Um, so if we think about our common misalignments from yesterday, um, hence why I cover alignments and body motions, how it's all connected before we talk about injuries, what do we do most often? We have this forward head, rounded shoulders, postures, because the world is, again, out in front of us. So what we need to do is the opposite. So what we do, lay on our belly, reach your arms out straight in front of you, out like a Y, out like a capital letter T. We start adding in some cactus squeezes, but we're on our belly. Don't just bring them to locus and let them find the bind. When you find the bind, you have made it passive. Passive as in you're using your hands um, to create that upward motion. You're not using your back strength. Um, so making them come into more locus without finding rotation. Again, the biggest thing with injuries is that people are going to compensate and learn how to compensate because they that's just naturally what their body wants to do and they will do it on their mat and it will show up on their mat and you need as a teacher to watch them enough to be able to help them get out of these common behaviors. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice on Q alternate on Q alternatives as far as different ways to get the same end result just because people interpret things differently? What specifically are you asking for as far as cues go? Um, what cues? What are you trying to get the people into so I can offer you a better advice? Would be my only question. Same end result. I guess. What is your end result? And then I can better help you there. Um, yeah, so just leave that for me and I'll be able to answer your question. Um, but you're right, everyone interprets things differently. So having a toolbox of things will be great. Um, okay, so then as far as scoliosis goes, making sure they're doing their back extensions with the strength, with using the arms, um, but still being able to stay in alignment, not just shifting off to the side of that's tight or shifting away from the side that's tight. Normally they'll shift to it, but again, everyone's different. Um, the next question I had was SI joint. So for the SI joint, it's the same thing. So you want to make sure the hips are level. They probably have their favorite hip. They probably have their favorite way to cock out to the side, let their toes face out. Um, but then specifically for females, I have a ton of females on here. Um, lots of yo uh, female yogis. What I see a lot of is, um, during your cycle, during, um, Oh, Shoki, if I'm not mistaken, during ovulation and then the next right up into the beginning, um, you will get laxity in your joints. So if you notice when you have your SI joint pain, is it only during ovulation right up until your, the start of your moon cycle? Um, because we find more laxity, there's more laxity in our fascia when with the hormones, with estrogen. Estrogen binds um, fancy, fancy, fancy. Let's not get into the research. But basically, estrogen will bind, makes you more lax during ovulation right up until your menses. So cool. Um, so noticing when they ha start having their symptoms, their SI joint pain, um, might it might just be them having to modify during those few days. Um, but then also, what you can do for it is core strength. 
Um, particularly, I love the dead bug. The dead bug is when you lay on your back with your knees stacked over your hips, your hands up to the sky, and you just press your low back flat. This does not look like 30, 60, 90 lifts. This does not look like doing um, alternating leg lifts. This looks like holding and squeezing and turning on the transverse abdominis, the muscle that comes around your belly, pressing your low back into the floor, pulling your hip flexors in, scooping your belly, and then you're turning on those really deep stability muscles. Um, from there, we can start to get into some hip flexor strengthening because, again, that plays a really big role in the SI joint. We can start to strengthen the hamstrings because that gets really big into the SI joint. Um, we can work on opening up through the piriformis because that plays a huge role in the SI joint. Um, but a lot of what I see is people having their favorite hip to cock off to, and then they kick the other leg out. Um, if you're driving, picture the right foot. Your right foot just kind of stays in line. It does all this stuff. The left leg's kind of cocked out. You bring it up here, and you're tucking it in. You're finding like a half lotus pose, um, all that stuff, and now you're driving. So my left leg is way externally rotated while my right leg is having to be kind of shoved in because, again, I'm driving, so I need to keep my foot in certain positions um, will totally change which which way your hips are shifted off to and then the fascia starts to get stuck there and then now we have SI joint pain um, so noticing the difference in the left versus right everything that attaches to the pelvis the hamstrings inner thighs the um, hip flexors your low back um, and then your core strength as well all of that will play a role um, and then, yeah, just making sure all those muscles are turned on. So finding your bridges, finding your static holds, finding your crescent lunge, keeping the hips level. Um, again, pulling the right hip back if you're seeing a shifting front to back, if you're seeing a shifting up and down. Um, yes, cool. Okay, so as far as our next injury, let's talk about the shoulders. So on the way up, everything will play a role the back muscles but most importantly the shoulder blade so the shoulder blade has a huge role in the shoulder because it makes up the socket joint that your humerus fits into your upper arm bone fits into um, so check the shoulder blades first easiest to see this on people without shirts on so just sports bras or uh, gentlemen have to have them take their, their shirts off um, and then just have them take their hands to the side bring their hands up and bring their hands back down nice and slowly hands come up and all the while you are in standing behind them watching their shoulder blades come up and watching their shoulder blades come down if you if you watch somebody with a shoulder injury you'll see the scapula on whatever the injured side is either it sits up already cocked up a little bit higher or it's slow to the party so as you start to bring your shoulder blades up as you raise your hands up over 90 degrees the shoulder blades want to rotate you'll see one either running late either running fast or not moving at all. So just noticing the shoulder blades, awesome ways to cue the shoulder blades to teach how to get rid of whether it's winging or just misfiring. Hold plank pose with some protraction. So protraction, when you bring the shoulder blades away, you round and dome up through your um, upper back and then play with some retraction. So squeezing your shoulder blades together. You can do this in plank pose. If plank is too hard and too challenging, you can do this on your knees. Um, from there, you progress into a crow pose with more of the protraction. You progress um, more into picture a plank while you reach your shoulders over your fingertips and then play with kind of keeping that. Then we start to walk our feet in nice and slowly all the while keeping the protraction. So teaching the shoulder blades to move as a unit. Um, but then picture your cobra. In your cobra pose, you're laying on your belly, your hands are down, um, sweep your elbows in, wrap your triceps, um, shoulders come away from your ears, and then slightly squeeze your shoulder blades together. So all of the muscles, again, in your back. Locust pose for days. Bring their arms out. Have them go opposite arm and leg. Have them bring their hands out like a Y. This is going to work more of your uh, lower trap muscles, so coming down your back. 
arms out like a T, just lift the arms is gonna be more of what we call your middle trap muscles. So just having different ways to help strengthen their back because again, yoga doesn't work the pull, but we can work the muscles that help you pull by finding locus using gravity to help make things harder. Um, that's as far as the shoulder. Another thing I see a lot of is people have tight internal rotation. Internal rotation is when you bring your hands up your back from the back. External is going to be this way. So internal rotation here. Um, awesome ways to play with it. Take a strap, reach it behind you, and then you can pull your strap up and then start to find the stretch here. Um, Another awesome way is uh, for what I call the sleeper stretch. So for the sleeper stretch, you're going to reach your arm out in front of you and come to lie on your shoulder. So you're lying, locking your shoulder in as you rock your belly towards um, the, the ground in front of you. Take your hand where your watch or your bracelets would be and you press your palm to the floor. Um, so on the table, it looks like this. You reach your hand out in front. You roll, hand where your watch would be, press down to the floor. This is an awesome stretch. Notice if your ear, excuse me, your shoulder's coming way up to your ear. Noticing if you're leaning way back because that's going to take the stretch out of it. You roll the chest forward and then press your palm down to the floor just a little bit more. will help open up the shoulder blade. Um, excuse me, open up the shoulder internal rotation. Um, cool. And then as far as um, the wrist goes, have people stay off their wrist. If they are an advanced practitioner trying to find handstands, check their shoulders first. Check the rotator cuff. Um, we're not going to get into how to strengthen um, some of this more generic rotator cuff stuff, um, all this little rehab stuff. If you're looking for that, definitely sign up for the course because that's my specialty and that's what I love. Um, some of the more, I call it yoga rehab. So adding rehab, rehabilitation into your yoga flows um, because everyone needs a little bit of extra time working those little small muscles and not the big ones that do all the motions. Um, so making sure that you're offering some strengthening, um, whether that's just being in high plank and you start to shift side to side to help cue on some of the shoulders first. Um, but if they're having wrist pain, number one, get off their hands. Have them just come onto their forearms. Try the block like we talked about before. Um, but as a yoga teacher, you need to know how to make your flows wrist free. Um, if you're a vinyasa teacher, this is harder. Um, but knowing how to make your flows wrist free um, Picture being on your elbows and your knees to step your foot outside your right hand or your right elbow. It's not going to be as easy. Do you have blocks? Can you bring their elbows up onto the block? So that makes the step through easier. Um, so just knowing that you need to have modifications, you need to have a flow that is risk free. Um, oh, yes. Scoliosis. Um, it's uh, oh, Kristen. So good to see you. Um, Kirsten, excuse me, so happy you're doing this. Scoliosis, yes, handful of students, extreme, okay. Um, would love to give them more modifications and postures, blah, blah, blah. What are your thoughts and adjustments to assist on those with scoliosis? Okay, um, real recap on scoliosis. Keep the hips square. Um, so making sure that like in your crescents, in your warrior twos, not that the hips will be square in warrior twos, but noticing does one hip sit higher than the other? Um, does one hip sit way forward than another, whether it's the front to back or it's the left to right, um, excuse me, left to right or up and down might be better cues. Keeping the hips level because some, the scoliosis will come down and definitely play an effect on the hips. Um, I like to bring them to bridge pose a lot and notice what hips on top and then ask them to kind of march one leg out in front of them. You'll notice one side's going to be way tighter, one side's going to be way weaker and try to try to drop. Um, and then throwing in all the locusts, all the locusts, no binds, arms out. Um, opposite arm and leg lift up is a really awesome one because it helps get the fascia from the spiral line going. Um, but then also hands out like a Y, hands out like a T, and just making sure they don't rock side to side are going to be really awesome ways to just kind of noticing which ways they want to compensate through because they will have their favorite ways to compensate. Really great question. Um, and I'll DM you here just to make sure you have everything you need um, when we're done here, just to make, again, just to make sure. But um, as far as other injuries, if you guys have specifics, let me know. Um, 
if you want to learn more, absolutely, absolutely. I cover all of this in my online course. Um, so for the online course, really, I just want to let you guys know that I have been there too. I have been working with students and I have no idea what to do to the point of I have stopped my class, um, stopped my class and been like, okay, we got to start somewhere else. Let's do this differently. Um, it's embarrassing and it sucks and I'm supposed to know everything, but I just want to let you guys know I have been there and I've had to do it. And as much as it sucks, it's better to know that you are keeping your people safe than you look silly. And yeah, I get goosebumps when I say that because it, I mean, sucks looking silly and it sucks looking like you don't have your stuff together. But if you know that you are causing more harm to your people than you are doing good, you have to just own it. Um, so the intention of my course that I have built specifically for you as yoga teachers is to help you understand the workings of the body, how it's connected. Um, I don't go in and teach you every single muscle because I don't think that's important. We cover, these are the quads, these are the hamstrings. Um, and if you want to learn more, I tell you exactly where to find it. Um, but my intention for you in this course is to help you understand the workings of the body so that you can take the principles and apply them to all injuries and apply them to everything that you may see. Um, and it gives you a better hand as far as what to say, when to step in, why you're stepping in. Again, for me, it's always the why. If I can understand why something is the way it is, why you need something, why a certain student or a certain population may need something, what's the functionality. I am such a better teacher, I feel way more prepared, and I'm able to give my students exactly what they need while they are in front of me. Um, I'm able to then convert those students into private clients because, man, Gab, you know so much. How did you keep me so safe? This pose has never felt like this before. That's how you convert. That's how you get people diving into their bodies. Um, so, yeah. So, anyways, I want to invite you into my online course. Um, I want to invite you into my group coaching. So, it's going to be capped at 10 yoga teachers or students, whoever wants to learn. Um, I have one Pilates instructor interested as well. So, it doesn't just stop at the yoga. Um, but as far as the group coaching, we will learn, we will cover what we cover in the course and if you guys have students you can be working through it while we're meet um, as we meet um, each week but my intention is to help you derive meaning behind your students help you learn why you're doing things a certain way with the students that you have in front of you um, we have one module in the group coaching that is just on privates so how to make the environment great for for clients how to give them you know it's awkward do you touch them all the time do you not touch them all the time um, I am a fan of helping people dive into their bodies into the workings of it stepping in when you need to I have some students that love adjustments and literally are paying me to put my hands on them to help them feel what they need to feel in their bodies squeeze through here press through here more and that has been made the huge difference um, the clients that I've had as privates who have been injured, they've been able to almost what I call graduate from privates with me, and now they come into my group classes all the time. So again, the intention of the group coaching is to help you guys be better yoga teachers with the students that you already have. So not using these avatar learning things where I just tell you about SI joint pain and how it's so different and giving you some practical things, but not maybe specific to what you see um, in your students, not specific to Joanna who comes every Thursday night who can't do this pose, this pose, and this pose. We can then figure out why. Um, we can then have you recording her, bring the recordings into our group coaching, and then we can start breaking down what I see and helping you see it differently. Um, we can do the same for your private practice. So those are my expectations for the group coaching. Um, I also am offering one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if you are not a group person, which I understand, um, if you learn better one-on-one, -on -one, I will absolutely help you dive into your students. Um, I will help you make an impact. I will help grow your private client business if that's an intention for you. Um, 
But yeah, my intention for this online course, for the group coaching, for the one-on-one -on -one, is to really help you understand movement, understand the body, how it's all connected, and really what to expect when you ask a student to do something in a certain way. What can you expect? Where do you need to stand to see it best? Um, and then how to modify. So please let me know what questions you guys have. Um, as things come up, let me know. If you have questions, if you wanna hop on a call, I'm doing alignment calls and with anybody just to make sure that we're good, I'm a good fit for you and you're a good fit for the group. Um, so yeah, let me know what you need. Again, I will leave all of these links for you. Um, and tomorrow is our day four. We are going to be covering um, functionality. So how to keep it functional, how to, what does that even mean? Um, how to gauge what the function of your students is, what they need, maybe how to ask them what they're looking for, um, a little bit better way of just saying, why did you guys show up today? Um, and then it makes it seem like you have no idea what you're doing anyways. Um, so tomorrow we will cover functionality and I look forward to seeing you there. Let me know what you guys need, what questions come up, and if you wanna hop on a call, I'll leave all the links below. Love you guys, namaste.